Secretary of State, yeah. Who was the Secretary of State? Let me and the Vatican Secretary of State, yeah. Who was the Vatican? Let me see who was the And the Vatican Secretary of State, yeah. Who was the Vatican? It's late to come out, and they would have gone back out. Prepare for what's going to be happening out there on the field. The biggest charge is about shooting at each other. The Union's fought, shot over the Confederates, trying to hang their line of men, ready to march that one mile long death march. And the boys in gray fired back, hitting the horses and supplies of the Unions. It was so loud, they could hear it as far away as Philadelphia. Shook the homes and the houses here in town, and as far away as Hershey, Pennsylvania. The people that are living hunkered down in these cellars, probably thinking this is the end of the world. It's Armageddon. We're all going to die. It would be later on that they kept firing at each other. It would be later on that they kept firing at each other. The cannons going off, but the boys in blue had a plan. They said, "We're going to stop firing our cannons because we're almost out of ammunition." It worked. The boys in gray said, "Look." You're out of ammunition. Keep on firing, boys. Keep on firing. Which they did. They kept firing the ammunition from the cannons for over 300 more times until they ran out of ammunition themselves. They said, Sir, we're out of ammunition. That's when they gave the order to engage the troops to march one mile long. Shoulder to shoulder, they marched across Pickett's Field towards the sunken road at Emmitsburg Road. Pickett's Field, towards the sunken road at Emmitsburg Road. The boys in blue start shooting their cannons again. Oh, look, they're not out of ammunition. Well, how lovely is this? Not for the Confederates, a complete bloodbath. The ones that were able to make it the sunken road to Emmitsburg Road had to get over that fence. The ones that did had a problem because they got a hand-to-hand -hand combat, but you already knew that they have lost this battle here at that day. As they were retreating back, Mr. Robert E. Lee looks at him and says, As they were retreating back, Mr. Robert E. Lee looks at him and says, As they were retreating back, Mr. Robert E. Lee looks at him and says, They are all dead. It is now the morning of July 4th, 1863. The Confederates were ordered to get out of town. They have lost this battle. They have lost this battle. They have lost this battle. They packed Boston's battle. They packed up what little they had, and the wounded and dead were still wounded and dead left out there on the field. Onto wagon trains, and they headed down to what we call the Fairfield Road back to Shenandoah Valley, with a 17-mile-long wounded wagon. The British, but also it was Miss Georgia McClellan's birthday. What better way to celebrate your birthday than to have to bury your own sister within your backyard? They didn't have time to say their fair goodbyes and farewells because it was raining hard. The boys in blue had a job to do to repair the damages the boys in gray made the days before and to help the wounded. Now, and we're going to talk about Jenny Wade. Because now we're going to talk about Jenny Wade. Because now we're going to talk about Jenny Wade. Mr. We're going to talk about Georgia McClellan. Mr. McClellan. Mr. We're going to talk about. Georgia McClellan, Mr. McClellan, Mr. We're going to talk about Georgia McClellan, Mr. McClellan. What a way to celebrate your sister, even through death. What better way to celebrate your sister, even through death. What better way to celebrate your sister, even through death. What better way to celebrate your sister, even through death. The flag next door to it is called the Perpetual Flag. It is raised 24/7, 75 seven days a week, 365 days a year. Thank you, Iowa Relief Corps, Ms. George McClellan, and the Iowa State Government for that flag. But there is another flag that's raised for a very important patriotic female in America, important patriotic female 
in America, important patriotic female in America for the same reasons. So I'd like to take a guess who she is. She would be for the same reasons. So I'd like to take a guess who she is. She would be for the same reasons. So I'd like to take a guess who she is. She would be considered the the founder of the American flag. Betsy Ross. You got it, Miss Betsy Ross. So I'm gonna end my part of the story talking about Mrs. Wade. Guys, four years ago, right where Tracy is sitting, on one of our midnight tours, there was a young boy named Ryan and his brother sitting right there. At 11.55 is when Ryan's experience begins, and he describes it this way. Every seat down here that night was taken, so we didn't have any room for anybody to sit. At 11.55, Ryan described it as though hands pushed his shoulders to the wall, and he couldn't move. Now, the funny thing is, nobody saw it. Lights are still on, and nobody sees anything until a few seconds go by. Guys, as Ryan tells it, he said those same hands he said it felt like grabbed his elbows and lifted him off of the bench. Now, he doesn't know why, but a few seconds go by, and he sits back down. Guys, when he stood up, everybody noticed it. But we can't explain what happened. We thought he was just tired of sitting down. Oh, he was just tired of sitting down. Oh, he was just tired of sitting down. Here's the interesting part, guys. By this time, it's midnight. The lights are off. So we're all sitting in the dark. Ryan describes it happening again. As he tells it, he said those same hands came back, pushed his shoulders to the wall, and he couldn't move. A few seconds later, he described the hands coming back. They say that he grabbed his shirt and pulled Ryan so that he almost falls on the floor in front of that bench. At 12.05, the lights came back on. Ryan stood straight back up. He looked right at me and said, Eric, I don't want to sit here anymore. I don't like it. So of course I told him he doesn't have to. Here's the scene, guys. Ryan's little brother is still sitting there. Ryan, though, had got up and walked to that far wall. He stands with his back to the wall, facing out this way. Let me set the scene for you. Our guests are all here, okay? Ryan is at that wall with his back to it. Our guest speaker that evening was right up here in the front row, and by this time, I had been sitting on the staircase. A few minutes go by, and we hear a thud upstairs. And we know it shouldn't happen. What's my first reaction, guys? Remember, I'm on the stairs. I run up and I check to make sure that nobody's above us. And I couldn't find a single person. Speakers. 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 That only war can produce. Jack Skelly's last message to his sweetheart in Gettysburg went undelivered. The irony doesn't end there, though. Even if West had lived, the message to Jack's sweetheart could never have been delivered. She was also lying dead at that moment in this very cellar. Her name was Jenny Wayne. These orbs don't be playing down here. <laughs>